13th of May 2013, 6.45am. The closed circuit television camera on the junction of Western Avenue and Preston Street records a young woman walking east. She's wearing blue jeans and a red t-shirt and has a large satchel slung over her left shoulder. The next camera on the intersection of Castle Street records her buying a big issue from vendor 7395. The camera opposite Churchill Square records her entering Starbucks at 7.01. 72 police CCTV camera court, CCTV cameras record the streets of Brighton and Hove. Over 6,220,800 seconds of footage every day. The young woman, recognisable by her large corkscrew curly hair, is on camera for a total of 38 seconds, just six ten thousands of the day's footage. A face in the crowd, a needle in a, no, not a haystack, that's too bucolic. Let's say a needle in a junkie's den, but we digress. The Churchill Square camera records her exiting at 7.04 and sitting down at the first immediate bus stop to the right of Starbucks. But there is no footage of her getting on the bus, no footage of her walking away from the bus stop. As of 7.04 on the 13th of May 2013, there is no footage of the young woman at all. She had vanished. 8.32. Troubled dreams rise like bloated, rotten fish as she surfaces from the dark depth of unconsciousness. Pulse thudding, ears buzzing as if a swarm of angry blue, bo blue bottles are trapped inside her skull. She cracks an eyelid, a slit, enough to gauge the light level, but there is no light. It's darker than a coal miner's arse crack. There's a noise, a faint scraping, a rustle, and then a vicious smell stabs into her, her olfactory system. She recoils from the chopstick-esque grab to her nostrils. Ammonium carbonate is as unmistakable as it is unforgettable. The expert factor of choice for 19th century decisions, boxing coaches and torturers in a hurry. Where did that thought come from? A soft brush of cloth against her face before grubby daylight slams into her retinas. Heavy air, laced with decay, drapes over her like a shroud. She pants, lungs struggling for oxygen. Slumped in an armchair. Been there for hours with the stiff neck as a flu. There's a table, some medical equipment, a collapsible wheelchair, a dented steel instrument tray, syringes, shit. Panic thoughts scramble over one another, but her memory is blank. Hello, Cassandra. She winces, drags herself upright. Knuckling her gritty eyes, she sees the woman moving across her field of vision. The newcomer lowers herself into a chair behind the table. The instrument, strip, the instrument tray with its syringes rests on the scuffed tabletop between them. The tableau resembles a painting she's seen. Offerings to a celebrity. The woman's not so god of medicine, though. She looks more receptionist. Where? <clears throat> the words choke off in a cough, her tongue's a sun-baked dishcloth. The stranger rummages in a rucksack by her feet, emerges with a bottle of water and leans over to pass it to her. <coughs> Wrong question, says the woman. Where is isn't important. It's the why you need to worry about. I, I don't understand. The words come easier with a wet mouth. Tell me about Christian Ackerman's death. <coughs> A strange expression scuttles across the woman's face, but Cassie's too distracted, too confused to interpret it. At the mention of her ex's <coughs> name, memories bubble up from the fathoms and she sags, relieved. Almost. I told the police everything. I gave a statement. Just read it again. I'm not a police officer. Cassie swivels her eyes. The movement repositions her gummy contact lenses and the room swims into focus. Small, furnished with mismatched chairs, a rusty bed frame and a wooden chest of drawers. Stained pink carpet covers the floor and dirty wallpaper peels away in patches, revealing crumbling lath and plaster. The bay bulb above her head is hung with filthy cobwebs. No visible drawer, but two sash windows, moth-eaten floral <coughs> curtains drawn against the feeble light to break the expanse of the wall behind the woman. Not home, not a police officer. Possibilities scud across her mind. Something snags. Her thoughts drop to a standstill. You know my name. I know a lot about you, Cassandra Thornton. 
The woman tilts her head and narrows her eyes. 25, born on a military base in Cyprus, mother died in childbirth. Cassie swallows back a hot tang of vomit. How? Your, your mother, your grandmother raised you. She's dead too, isn't she, Cassandra? The woman pulls a thick manila envelope from her rucksack and places it next to the instrument tray. All here, she taps her finger on the envelope. Driving license, exam results, chemistry college scholarship, unusual with an old pub and your medical records, which were very elucidating. The woman jumps her fingers and peers at Cassie who snaps. Got my shoe size in there too. Quick as a rattlesnake, the woman lunges and Cassie's ear is left ringing from a hard slap. This is not the game, says the woman. But Cassie's not listening. She scrambles to her feet, whirls around, searching for the door. The room carousels wildly. She can't coordinate her limbs. She trips, catches her cheek on the corner of the table as her knees connect with the floor. Pain bursts across her face, wiping out her vision. She gulps, lung for the air, sobs wrapping her chest. Black roots inches from her nose. Fausty smelling dust clouds bloom from the carpet. Arms hoist her back into the armchair. The woman squeezes Cassie's wrist and grabs a syringe from the table. 75 millilitres of sodium theopental. I could get this in your veins before you make it halfway to the door. Sodium theopental. The words pinball around Cassie's brain. Anaesthetic. Induces medical coma. Controls conventions. Facilitates hypnotic state. It's Hollywood's tooth serum. Yes, but police in India did use it to coerce a confession from child murderers. I tell you what you want to know, I swear. Wise choice, says the woman. She releases Cassie's arm and returns to her seat, dropping the syringe in the tray as she passes. After all, I don't know how it will react with the hypnol in your system. Cassie gasps, glances at the bottle of water in her lap. Only two thirds conscious, she drank from it without thinking. Shit. She places the bottle on the table and pushes it away, wiping her mouth with the back of her hand. It leaves a smear of blood. Alarmed, she squints at it, transfixed by the sharp contrast of red against her pale skin. Blood. It was about blood. Memories teem, churning the waters of her mind. I went to town. I bought a coffee. There was something, something important at the edge of her memory. Oh, on my way to... She gropes for more details, but memories are still too amorphous. Sleek as little fish, they dart from her grasp as soon as she touches them. Focus, Cassandra. The woman slams her hand on the table, sending the fringes skittering. Cashy flinches, wipes her clammy hands on her jeans. I was submitting my thesis. Tea as well, and she screams at her face to stop them falling. Don't you dare cry, Clayton. She glances at the woman. Did she notice the blood, the tears? The shape of the woman's mouth shifts as her cheek muscles tighten. Is she smiling? The expression's all wrong, like a stained glass window, hammer smashed and reassembled blind. Cassie shudders with flesh crawling. She forces herself to study her captor, thinking, hoping to need to recount the details of her hero. Brain screaming kidnapper, her eyes disagree. They catalogue a plain, average looking woman with stiff posture, mid twenties perhaps, with black framed glasses, neat brown bob and unremarkable clothes, dark trousers and a burgundy button blouse. They study each other in silence, a sapping, sucking silence which breaks Cassie first. Christian killed himself, Cassie whispered. The mutilation suggests otherwise. What mutilation? The woman studies her unblinking. You expect me to believe you don't know. I don't know about any mutilation. The voice is shrill. Please, you have to believe me. The woman gives her a cold, hard stare. Eyes the colour of morbid pennies, but less alive. Cassie's earlier impression of the woman as a receptionist returns, when he'd enjoy unpaid overtime at Auschwitz. <laughs> you wasted five questions when you only needed one. You should have asked, "What do I need to get out to do to get out of here alive?" Cassie huddles deeper in the chair as the woman leans towards her. There's something strange about her eyes. Later, Cassie would recall that the woman never blinked, not once. You're alone. No one is looking for you. You know what I want and what I'm prepared to do to get the truth. She produces the cold facsimile smile again. Shall we begin?